I'm Phil Zimmerman, and uh, I'm going to try to keep you entertained for the next hour. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, first they asked me to talk about Hushmail, but um, you know, I I, I I I could spend a little time on Hushmail, but I just thought it'd be better if I if I told some war stories from ten years of PGP. Um, and uh, just a bunch of other things. Um, I guess uh, perhaps many of you know that uh, I no longer work at, at Network Associates, and uh, I'm uh, off doing consulting work, including helping other companies implement op the Open PGP standard. Uh, since there's probably a lot of German attendees here, I expect there will be a, a sizable number of uh, of, of paranoid conspiracy theories about backdoors in PGP, and I'll be happy to entertain questions along those lines. Um, half of all the email I get asking me about backdoors come from Germans. <laughs> I don't know why. It doesn't, you know, for some reason it, the other European countries don't seem to have so many people who think this way, but for some reason Germany does. I was giving a talk in Helsinki a few months back and uh, it was about 500 people in the room, and um, uh, one guy raised his hand, and this is in Helsinki, so it's mostly Finnish people. One guy raised his hand and asked if, if I could comment on the, on, uh, the, the fact that uh, the government was implanting chips in our heads uh, when at birth to track us as we uh, threw out, you know, to follow us, you know, kind of like, and the other state, you know, and um, and I asked him where this guy was from, and he said Germany. <laughs> this is kind of funny. I said, does this work? The other way around, like this. <laughs> this is cool. It's like, you know, it's like my Mouseketeer hat, you know. Okay, now I can walk around. I have a lot of nervous energy, so I can dissipate that more easily now. Otherwise, it would just come out in my speech. Um, usually, these things are with clip-on mics, and I always like to make the same joke. That's the nice thing about giving talks in so many different countries, is you can tell the same joke again and again, and nobody knows. So the joke that I usually tell with this is that, is that you know, with, the, with Moore's Law and the miniaturization of electronics, they'll be making these so the, these clip-on mics will just, they could be part of your clothing and you could be monitored 24 hours a day. And uh, this would be called a clipper mic. <laughs> and, and your voice would be saved somewhere, uh, encrypted of course, uh, with key escrow. And that way they could always recover it later if they have to investigate you for something. Um, anyway, um, let's see now. Oh yeah, the chip in the head with the train. It was, it was the only German in the room because I said, he said he was from Germany and I said, is there anybody else here from Germany? And not a single hand went up. So this is like 500 people in the room. He was the only German there and he, and, you know, and I always, you know how it's always later on that you always think of the funny answers to the question that you should have, you should have had this better witty answer. You know, what I really should have said was, I can't comment on that. <laughs> I, get, I get email from people who, you know, who believe in black helicopters. Um, <clears throat> who, you know, you remember that movie Conspiracy Theory, you know, with Mel Gibson and whatever? You know, he, all those conspiracy theories with black helicopters. This is the kind of email I get. For some reason, cryptography attracts paranoid people. And they write to me. And they somehow think that I, you know, believe in their, their conspiracies. Because if I did something that they like, like writing PGP, then, you know, I must be one of them. And they never suspect that I could be part of the conspiracy. <laughs> No, actually, I do get mail from people who, they, who ask me uh, if, if there's any backdoors in PGP. They ask me this. They ask me an email in this kind of quiet voice, this quiet email voice. They say, 
you know, I've heard, a friend told me that there's a back door in PGP. Can you tell me if this is true? I won't tell anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I just, when I see this, I have to sit on my hands for a couple of minutes to avoid typing a response. That's the trouble with email is, you know, email has this, you know, it's not like writing a letter, which you, you might take a day to, before you send it off and it, you can, you can deliberate about what you're going to put in it. It has that itchy trigger finger of a video game. <laughs> you can just type whatever flashes in your mind and <laughs> send, you know, and it, and it goes. And that's what I feel like doing when I get mail like that. Um, I want to say, well, okay, I'll tell you, but don't tell anyone else. Yes, there's a backdoor in PGP, but please don't tell Soul. I'm only telling you because I trust you. <laughs> 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 usually, I, I usually I, I just I give, I give this really long answer. I, I, I waste too much of my time on these answers, <clears throat> saying, you know, first of all, do you think I would tell you if there was a back door? And and uh, you know, and I especially got a lot of these right after the feds dropped the case against me, because everybody suddenly thought that, oh, well, obviously they can break PGP because. Otherwise, why would they let him go? So from the point of view of these people, I would have to spend the rest of my life in hell in order to get them to keep trusting PGP. As soon as they, in fact, if they had sent me to prison, you know, if, if the, on the day they let me out, if I served my sentence and, and walked free one day after serving my entire prison sentence, there would be people that would say, ah, obviously they can now break PGP because they let them out of prison, you know? I guess if they shot me, then maybe that would keep them happy for me. They would trust PGP forever. Such a deal. Um, and then, uh, and then years later when I started, uh, well actually shortly after the feds dropped the case when I started the company, then there was another wave of email saying that there had to be a, a there would be a backdoor now because the company would be more subject to pressure from the government. And then later on, then it was after we were acquired by Network Associates, uh, that would no, that produced a big uh, bunch of email asking me about if, is there a backdoor because now uh, you know <clears throat> Network Associates is a large company, and as everybody knows, all large companies are in cahoots with the NSA. And, and in fact, the board of directors probably has NSA people on it, they would think, or at least people, members of the Trilateral Commission. I guess Europeans wouldn't know what the Trilateral Commission is. Actually, I don't even know what the Trilateral Commission is, but it seems to be a popular subject of paranoid conspiracy theorists. Anyway, um, And on the day that we were sold to Network Associates, um, I got a call from a, a reporter from Wired, Wired News, I guess. And he said, can you comment on the fact that Network Associates is a member of um, the Q Recovery Alliance? Um, well, I didn't know that Network Associates was a member of the Q Recovery Alliance, and, but I didn't want to tell the journalist that I wouldn't know something as important as that. So I said, let me get back to you on that. So I called up, um, uh, some guys on our board of directors, because we had just signed the deal. We hadn't even done all the paperwork yet to, to get fully acquired. And I said, hey, did you know that is, is that Network Associates is part of the Q Recovery Alliance? Did everybody know this but me? <laughs> and nobody knew it. In fact, nobody at Network Associates knew it either. <laughs> uh, and apparently what had happened was is that Network Associates had acquired many companies. And one of them, one of the smaller companies they acquired, I don't know which one actually, was a member of the Key Recovery Alliance. And you are what you eat. So they had eaten the company that was a member of the Key Recovery Alliance and therefore they were also. They had this demon seed growing inside them uh, of this evil force within the Key Recovery Alliance. The Key Recovery Alliance was an industry group that was uh, creating cryptography products, uh, encouraging the creation of cryptography products that had backdoors 
for the NSA so that these products could be exported. It would be easy to get an export license that way. This is, of course, back in the days when it was illegal to export strong crypto from the U.S. And one of the only, you know, one of the only things you could do was to was to uh, put a backdoor in your product. So uh, one of the founding companies of the Key Recovery Alliance was a company called Trusted Information Systems, or TIS. They had a product, um, a, a VPN product with a, a, a backdoor for the NSA. Well, as soon as I found out about this, I, I called, uh, I found out about the Key Recovery Alliance. I, uh, I called the guys at Network Associates who we were negotiating with and I said, you have to get out of the key recovery lanes right away, immediately. They said, what do you mean, key recovery lanes? And they had to check first to see if it was true that they were a member of the key recovery lanes. And when they found that they were, they said, okay, and they got off. Within 24 hours, they were out of that organization. And so there were two articles in Wired, um, in Wired News. One said, you know, PGP acquired by a company that is a member of the Key Recovery Alliance, and the other one, 48 hours later, was Network Associates drops out of the Key Recovery Alliance. So that seemed to reassure a lot of people. But then about six months later, or maybe four or five months later, Network Associates acquired another company, Trusted Information Systems. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, the, the, you know, the email conspiracy theory is really starting to pour in because they thought now trusted information systems would control us. And in fact, actually, TIS really did have ex-NSA people on their board of directors. In fact, the CEO was, used to be an NSA guy. He was a nice guy, Steve Walker, right? He's a, you know, I've known him for years. You know, I don't know what he did at NSA, but I don't think it was signals intelligence, so. But anyway, um, but they didn't control uh, uh, what happened to PGP, and in fact, uh, I again raised objections to us being a member of the Key Recovery Alliance, and I said, we've got to get out. Well, it turned out, though, that, um, um, it, that you know, that that's an organization you have to pay to be a member of, and, uh, you know, our membership was about to expire. I mean, TIS's membership was about to expire, and was about to, it would have to be renewed, so they didn't want to just visibly drop out because they were applying for an export license for something, I forgot what, PGP maybe, but something for uh, exporting some crypto stuff. And they said, uh, why don't we just uh, not renew our membership? It's, it expires next month anyway. So I said, okay. So the membership exp expiration time came, but the Key Recovery Alliance didn't want us to drop out because they were really getting beaten up by the computer industry and everybody hated them. So they wanted to hang on to us, so they wouldn't drop us from their website and still said we were members. So we had to actually call them up and said, look, you know, we haven't paid. <laughs> it's time to let go. <laughs> so finally we got that scraped off our shoes, you know, and uh, things were okay for a while. Um, but, you know, everything was okay as long as we kept publishing source code for PGP. Um, that was supposed to be a joke for those of you who know what happened later. <laughs> um, and so I stayed on for three years, um, uh, and I left uh, this past January. But one of the things that happened in the, in the, at the end of last year was that Network Associates, um, the business unit at Network Associates, came under new management, and the new management decided that they didn't want to publish source code anymore. Um, so, that was certainly a, a contentious issue uh, before I left. And, uh, and so, uh, since I left, they have not published the source code for any other versions of PGP subsequent to version 6.5.8. Uh, I was there for version 7.0, uh, 7.03. Uh, so I know there was no backdoors in that. Uh, and I try to tell people that there's no back doors, but you know a lot of people still don't want to use it because they didn't publish the source code. Uh, there's a new version out now, 7.1, and uh, I wasn't there for that development. I uh, don't imagine that there's back doors in that because it's still the same engineers working on it. But uh, 
I don't think I'm going to uh, waste my political capital trying to convince anybody of the integrity of the product that I wasn't even around for. So uh, maybe someday they'll change their mind. Um, anyway, uh, those of you who went to uh, an earlier session today on voice to love may know that I'm working on a uh, secure telephone product for implemented in Java. If there's any uh, Java programmers here that would like to volunteer to work on that, uh, there's no money in it because I don't have any funding for the project. I could use some help, so see me after the talk. Um, let's see. Rather than wait till the end for questions, I'd rather have questions come during the talk to keep the talk moving in directions that I know that you're interested in. No, I don't. Two PGP, you mean? No. No, uh, uh, they haven't released the source code for any version after 6.5.8. Yeah. Ah! Non disclosure agreements? Well, I don't know. I might have a non-disclosure agreement, but uh, I don't remember. I know that they asked me to sign an employment agreement when I first started there, and I never signed it. There's probably a non-disclosure agreement in that, so I guess I don't really have any. In fact, I never signed any agreements with Network Associates for the whole three years I worked there. But I'm not going to disclose whatever secret plans they have for future products, although my information is getting stale. But you know, if I signed a non-disclosure agreement, I don't think that I would regard the existence of a back door in PGP as covered by such an NDA. You know, that would be like some things are so egregious that uh, they kind of transcend uh, non-disclosure agreements. Yeah. What about PGP phone? I mean, it's like Well, PGP phone is an orphan product. Uh, I developed it in the mid-1990s uh, and uh, handed it over to PGP when I started the company. And they didn't want to sell it uh, because the, all the salespeople were focused on PGP. But since I was chairman of the company, I was able to force them to do things they didn't want to do. And I forced them to turn it into a product and release it. But after that, they just, they just weren't interested in it. So uh, because it's not in the same market as they were focused on. You know, uh, corporate IT departments didn't care about it. So it became an orphan product, and then later on, when it, the company was sold to Network Associates, it became an even more of an orphan product. Yeah? Which is, which is the biggest institutional or organizational installation of, of PGP that you know of? I don't know. I can give you certainly a lot of examples of, of organizations, but I don't know if they're big or how, you know, I don't know the relative size compared to other organizations. Um, I mean, for example, um, PGP is, as far as I know, uh, the technical solution for um, crypting email uh, if the customer requires it by the end, but that doesn't mean that they have a, a real, like, infrastructure for signing keys and stuff like that. No, so you could say that they are using it, but they are not using it in a, in a full scope or something. Yeah, they don't, you know, there is no um, formal public key infrastructure around PGP. Uh, companies all through the industry have struggled with the problem of rolling out large scale PKIs. Uh, the people in the X509 world have struggled for years with this. And, so, and, and PGP users have too. But PGP users, although they have not been uh, that successful in rolling out large centralized PKIs like you see in the X509 world, they have managed to avoid the need for it. For the past 10 years, PGP users have been able to use PGP comfortably without even having a centralized public key infrastructure and without feeling a strong need to have one. Because anybody can use PGP right out of the box, and uh, if they, they really have to, they can contact the other person by phone and verify the key fingerprint over the telephone and then start sending and receiving messages. So, um, you know, by, by 
democratizing the, uh, the public key infrastructure by allowing anybody to sign anybody else's key, they managed to sidestep the problem of certificate authorities. That's how PGP has, has gotten as far as it has. You know, most people don't encrypt their email. If you draw a pie chart of email, just all email in the world today, there's only a thin segment of the pie that's encrypted. I don't know how thin, just a few percent. Um, but if you take that one tiny slice of the pie and expanded it into its own separate pie chart, that pie chart being all encrypted email, the entire pie chart is PGP. You need sensitive laboratory instruments to uh, detect the microscopically tiny pharmaceutical impurities <laughs> of non-PGP encrypted email. Yeah. As I understand lockmail, and it, I, I, I've only just casually looked at it, I, I didn't actually try it out myself, but this is what I gathered from looking at their website. Um, they have PGP running on a web server. I mean, they actually just have commercial PGP. They actually bought a copy of PGP and installed it on a web server. And um, you can access it through the web, and the keys are all stored on the web, and you type in your passphrase, and it, you know your passphrase is sent um, to the server. I don't know whether it's hashed before sending. I don't think so. I think it's just sent to the server. It gets hashed, and it decrypts your private key on the server. And it uses it to decrypt your email and send the plain text down through an SSL connection to your browser, where you can read it. The problem with that approach is if anybody were to, um, you know, if there was a hostile takeover of that website, you know, if Louis Free walked in, actually Louis Free's out of a job now, isn't he? Yeah. If, you know, if Louis Free or his successor walks in with a subpoena and says, I, I want this guy's key, it, it would be possible for them to give him your key. I mean, they might have to wait until the next time you log in so that you type in your password so they can decrypt your key, but then they'd be in a position at that moment to hand over your key. Um, so I regard that as a, as a significant vulnerability. But you know, that's not so significant for some threat models. For example, if you're a human rights group and you're in uh, Guatemala, then um, um, and you don't want to store your private key on your laptop because the death squads might come in and take it or something like that. Or, I don't know. I, you know, maybe it actually a lot of some many people do use PGP in Guatemala, and it's passphrase protected on your laptop. But for some reason, they for ease of use issues, they want to keep it on a, on a remote web server. Then um, it wouldn't be so bad to use a system as I've just described because the dead squads are. I don't have so many dead squads in Guatemala today as they did during the mid 1980s. But you know, the, the army in Guatemala is not in a position to serve a subpoena on a web server in some other US or Canadian city. Not yet. Not yet, right. Yeah, there's that Council of Europe thing, right? For the, uh, um, but you know, even then, even, it's, it's unlikely that Western democracies are going to respect the court orders of police states. You know, I don't think the government of Burma is going to be able to you know, get someone's key from a web server in Vancouver. It's just unlikely that the Canadian government would cooperate in that case. So you, I think you have to look at the threat model that you're working in. Now, if you're, uh, if you're doing, if you, if you're already in a Western democracy and you're doing something that might be of some interest to the police in your country, then you might have to worry about the threat model that I described, where Louis Free or somebody like me, when your country walks in and gets a key from the server, but if it's from. Uh, you know, if you are a human rights worker and you're in, in, a, in an oppressive country, then and, and your your web server running PGP is in a is in a you know a civilized country, it's unlikely that the uh, that the death squads are going to be able to get to that key over there. So everybody has their own different uh, threat model, and the threat model for human rights workers seems to be more dangerous 
than the threat model also in this case because, you know, their opponents are armed and, and kill and torture people. And yet still, there's certain powers that they don't have that the police in civilized countries have. So um, there may be situations where that makes sense. Another thing that like that kind of approach might make sense if, is if that's running on a on a, a web server under the control of a company and all their users are employees and all the keys are, you know, for the company. But I don't think that's such a good idea uh, if uh, those keys are used to create signatures because if the company is in a position to obtain the private keys that create those signatures, then if there's some kind of dispute between the company and the employee over what he signed, then uh, the, company, the employee could repudiate his own signature. It's claiming that the company had access to the private keys. Uh, there's other approaches that you can do for web-based email encryption, though, that are better than that in, in that it's possible to store private keys on a web server but store them in encrypted form where the decryption of those keys are done in the browser by a Java applet instead of on the server. And in that case, the server is not, is not in a position to obtain the private key, even, even while you're using it, because the private key is, is never exposed in plain text form on the server. And the, uh, the prime example of this is Hushmail. Um, Hush Communications has a product called Hushmail that they've had for a couple of years now. And until recently, it was, uh, it was in a, a proprietary format, but, but as of uh, a couple of weeks ago, they uh, started, they came up with a, their 2.0 release, which has uh, uh, the open PGP format, which means in theory they should be able to interoperate with PGP users. Um, they're still working the bugs out of the 2.0 release. I generally worry about releases whose number after, after the decimal point is a zero. Um, the 2.1 release should be out by the end of next week, I'm told, and they're fixing a lot of problems. Uh, but with that, it's just like using PGP, except a lot simpler. Um, you don't have to really keep track of anything in a trust model, because uh, you, if, if you were talking just to another Hushmail user, because Hushmail was a closed system before. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, even uh, even serving the subpoena on the server would be would be not a successful way to get your hands on the private key. The private key is decrypted in the Java applet and it's erased after it's used, so it's more secure. Um, I actually have trouble using it because it uses Java, and I use a Macintosh, and the Macintosh has lousy support for Java. So uh, I have to go use somebody else's PC in order to pick up my hush mail. So I do it in cyber cafes and other people's offices. It's kind of handicapping when people ask me questions about the user experience for hush mail because I've only used it a few times. Uh, until the Macintosh has good job of support, I guess I'm, I'm stuck out of hush mail. Yeah? On what? Your new privacy card. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad to see an open source implementation of the open PGP standard. Uh, years ago, uh, when it was still my company, uh, those of us who were uh, you know, working at PGP Inc. were concerned about the future of the company. And we were worried that uh, uh, we were spending too much money uh, and that maybe things could go wrong with our business. And in fact, things did. We ran out of money. We had to sell our company. Um, so uh, we decided that we would launch an escape pod, and that would be the Open PGP Working Group. And if it became an industry standard, an IETF standard, then any company would be free to implement it, and it could never be closed. It's a good thing we did that. Now, there are multiple companies implementing that standard. And the fact that uh, Network Associates still has the original code base may not be as pivotally important in the long run as long as there are other companies implementing it. There's, uh, there's a company in Belgium that has a, uh, a mature commercial implementation that's been around for as long as my company's been around. 
well, my company isn't around anymore, but since the beginning of my company, uh, there's a guy in Belgium named Olivier Moret who contacted me during the criminal investigation about a year before I started the company. And he said that he wanted to develop an independent implementation of PTP from scratch. And he could sell it in Europe as long as I didn't have any objections. And I said, no, no problem. I certainly wasn't going to be selling PTP in Europe at that moment. Uh, so I said, go ahead. And then I turned my attention back to juggling chainsaws. <laughs> and then a year later, the, the government dropped their case against me, and I started getting pulling together, starting the company. And just as we were getting started, I got a phone call from this guy, and he said, hi, remember me from a year ago? Well, I've got it working now. Would you like to see it? And I said, sure. So he came to California, and I said, you know, i got bad news for you. Uh, we're starting a company now. And it was kind of bad news for him because uh, it meant that uh, we would be competing with him. But we wouldn't be competing with him right away because we were in the United States and he was in Europe. But it meant that it would be difficult for him to sell his product in the United States when PGP Inc. was getting started. So we were, uh, we were you know, quite a ways away before a product release. Uh, his product worked on the Macintosh, so uh, he didn't have a Windows version. Uh, so that kind of also reduced his market share. But anyway, today he does have a Windows version, and, and uh, he has other services he sells. And he's got this SDK that does PGP, and it's available commercially. And it's mature. It's been around for years. So uh, in theory, there is, a, at least on a technical level, commercial competition for network associates. Uh, unfortunately, all of these companies that, that like Lockmail and like uh, Ver it's now called Veritas, this company in Belgium, uh, in, in Hushmail, <clears throat> all small companies must be feeling the effects of the NASDAQ downturn. I haven't asked each one of them how they're doing financially, but the ones that I have asked, and I haven't asked a lot, I presume that, uh, that uh, if they're a small company, they must be feeling some effects of the downturn. The large companies are feeling those effects, but small companies in particular have to get second round financing and they can't do it if uh, you know, all the capital is dried up. Um, let's see. I can't remember where I was going. Now. Yeah. get started in crypto? Uh, well, if you go to my website, there's a bibliography. So go to philzimmerman.com and spell Zimmerman the German spelling with two N's at the end. Because if you don't, you'll get another philzimmerman.com, who's not me. There's a school teacher in Connecticut. And he was gracious enough to put a link to my webpage from his webpage, but this, he spells his with one N. And, and anyway, there's a, it says crypto bibliography if you click there. I don't know if you've got 80211 coverage in this room, but if you do, you can just visit it right now. Of course, if you do that, you won't listen to my talk, so. <laughs> uh, yes, GPG. I'm glad to see that there is an open source version of an open PGP implementation. Uh, I think it's available for Linux, but not for Windows. Is that correct? It's available for Windows now? Yeah? OK. Um, the more implementations, the better. I don't know anything about the cryptographic quality of it. I haven't looked at the source code. But uh, you know, I presume that a lot of other people have. And I hope that somebody has scrutinized it carefully to see if it collects entropy correctly and generates keys with the right random numbers and all those other little tricks. Yeah. Can you just say a few words about uh, patenting uh, the algorithms and about uh, civilizations arresting programs that uh, Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sure that everybody here has heard of uh, this arrest in the U.S. by of, uh, the Russian programmer Dmitry. How do you pronounce his last name? Stilovov. 
Sclero. Sclero. I kind of get that right. This is being video streamed, right? So now, soon he will discover that I forgot his name again. <laughs> My apologies. Sclero. Okay. Um, I think that um, that even if the, the, the relevant law, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, were a good law, which I think is a terrible law, but, if, but even if it were a good law, uh, a criminal prosecution is a blunt instrument to use for deciding complex public policy issues. Uh, to put somebody in jail for, for something like this, it's just, it's, it's horrible. Um, and then on top of that, the, the law itself is, a, is an atrocious law. It says that, um, I mean, it, it reduces the, the opportunity for fair use of copyrighted material because the material is, is encrypted. So if you try to extract portions of it for fair use, like you always could do before this came along, uh, you would have to defeat the encryption, which would make you subject to arrest. Um, not only that, but, uh, well, uh, okay, the thing about fair use is that there is a, there's supposed to be kind of a contract between uh, a content creator and, and, you know, an author and the state when he copyrights a work. He says, I will publish it and make it available if you give me certain protections. But, it give, but this new thing gives him too much protections it, by eliminating fair use. Another, another thing that it does is that it widens the net to, to make subject to prosecution people that are far removed from the actual crime, if you regard it as a crime, to, uh, to do the actual copying, the violation of the copyright. So this guy made some software that makes it possible to do the copying. Well, he's going to be arrested. And actually, he was working for some company that paid him to write the software. But they arrested him. Um, You know, it, during my own case, there was two civil litigation cases, uh, the, the Karn case and, and, uh, and the Bernstein case, that where they were suing the government to try to decide the issue about exporting crypto. Those are better, in the judicial system, those are better forums to decide these issues, not in a criminal prosecution. Uh, so I was greatly relieved when they didn't uh, make me go through trial. But in the case of Dimitri, you know, he's already indicted now. And so I presume there will be a trial. Now Adobe has come out against uh, his, uh, his arrest, but I would like to see Adobe go further by contributing money to his legal defense. If they do that, not only will that have some benefits to his legal defense, but it will send a strong message to the prosecutors, to the Justice Department, that you know, the, the allegedly injured party, Adobe, is contributing money to the legal defense of the defendant. Um, I have been in contact with, uh, with Dimitri's defense lawyer, Joe Burton, who was indirectly involved in my own legal defense team. Joe Burton, uh, a former prosecutor himself, in fact, he used to be in the same office as the prosecutor in this case. Uh, used to run that office, in fact. Uh, he's a good criminal defense lawyer, and in, in my own case, he represented the co-defendant in my case. Um, so he's in good hands as far as a criminal defense case, lawyer is concerned, and I think if it comes to trial, the government will probably lose. So, um, let's see now. trying to think of uh, what would be suitable for this audience. Yeah, okay, we just take a few more questions, maybe that'll get things. There already has been, because of the export controls that were in place for so many years, there already has been 
a shift in uh, cryptographic expertise. It used to be mostly in the United States. Uh, and then uh, the export controls um, kind of forced things in the direction of the Europeans developing a lot of cryptographic competence. Um, that's good for you guys, but uh, you know, you know, we kind of enjoy being the experts on, in, the, in the subject, and uh, we're kind of disappointed now that uh, we don't hold that monopoly anymore. I'm joking, of course. It's good to be able to go to crypto conferences in Europe and uh, talk to other cryptographers everywhere. Um, you know, for the past 10 years, the United States has been on an intellectual property binge. Uh, it's incredible what's happened to intellectual property law in the United States. It's not just the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, it's also patents on software algorithms, patents on genes, patents on uh, business practices. That's incredible. You know, you can actually get a patent on business models, business practices. Uh, and, then the, and then there's the, there's, the United States has this peculiar notion of extraterritoriality, where they think their law should apply all around the world. You know, I don't see the Dutch government trying to apply Dutch laws to, uh, you know, the United States. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> What happens when Iran starts applying, you know, fundamentalist Islamic laws to uh, the rest of us around the world? What? Oh, the satanic persons? Yeah. So they might send it to you to death, and, and uh, yeah, you know, we, that could happen to somebody running a website in the U.S., right? Yeah. Uh, the European Union is in the process of legally uh, Has, has already passed its opportunity to uh, to take hold. I think that it will go the way of PEM, um, Privacy Enhanced Mail, which existed about 10 years ago. Uh, it's possible in PGP to use the same trust model that you commonly see in the X509 world. There's nothing that says you can't have a large number of people all agree to trust a single introducer to certify keys for you. That would be a certificate authority. If everybody at IBM wanted to trust the IBM you know, certificate authority to sign all of the employees' keys, they could do so. Uh, in that case, PGP, the, trust, the PGP trust model collapses into a, it's kind of a degenerate case of the more general PGP trust model. It collapses into the, uh, the trust model that's used in the, more typically in the X509 world. I say typically because in X509, there's nothing intrinsically about X509 that says that it has to be that kind of trust model, a centralized trust model. You could have, in the X509 world, a PGP-like trust model, but you don't see too many products that have that kind of trust model in the X509 world, because the design of X509 really came from institutions that are institutionally uh, oriented toward the centralized trust model because they're oriented toward the centralized everything. And I think that, that products and architectures tend to resemble the institutions that gave birth to them. You know, that's why PEM failed. PEM, Privacy Enhanced Mail, which was an early, um, an early public key product or a standard. Um, you know, it, it, it why it failed. It, it, had a, um, it was developed by uh, people that came from uh, uh, institutions, from the military, from, uh, from defense contractors, from people that tended to think in centralized power terms. 
Uh, for example, every message had to be signed. Every message had to be, have a digital signature. You could not send an unsigned message. What kind of thinking is that? I mean, how could anybody imagine making a, a product where you can't send an unsigned message? You know, that kind of rigid thinking of institutional thinking, like the Pentagon or, you know, or, or intelligence agencies or something like that. That's, that's not the way the normal world works. It's not organic. It's not the way ordinary people do their business. And not only that, but it, you couldn't even, if you did, it, since you had to sign every message, you know, it was bad enough that you had to sign every message, but the signatures were on the outside of the envelope. You know, the signatures weren't encrypted. They were exposed. So you could see who signed the message even if you couldn't decrypt the message. You know, that's the first thing that I thought of in PGP is, oh no, we're not gonna do that. Actually, I didn't even know about PEM when I was designing PGP. Um, <clears throat> I objected to the uh, PEM design. I found out about PEM about a week before PGP's release. And I thought PGP was doomed. I thought PEM would just roll right over PGP because it had all these powerful institutions behind it. I was so demoralized by the fact that I thought that maybe I shouldn't even release PGP. Um, but I thought that I'd gone through all the work of making it, I might as well release it. Well, it didn't work out the way I was afraid it would. Uh, PEM was pretty much wiped out by PGP. Uh, not only did PEM have those problems of having to sign every message and uh, uh, that, you, that your signature appears on the outside of the message so that the authorities can see who you are, you know, even if they can't read the message. But uh, it also the encryption was 56 bit deaths. That was it. That was the strongest encryption you could get in 1991. Uh, so really, in 1991, there was no way for ordinary people to be able to communicate over long distances without the risk of interception. Um, you couldn't do it with PEM. You couldn't do it with, uh, what was that product from RSA? Um, MailSafe. You couldn't do it with FedEx, with telephones, with faxes, with postal letters. All of them were at risk of interception. In the, again, with the, in the cryptographic protocols, if they were intercepted, they could be cut through easily because of the 56-bit work factor for breaking them. Even in 1991, 56 bits was still insignificant to major governments. Yeah. Um, can you comment or do you have any comments on, um, uh, like, Bruce Schneier claiming recently uh, to have seen the light that cryptography is not solving any problems because the picture that in Alice wants to send Bob a secret message and is signing her, her message with a uh, secret key is wrong because she is not signing anything. The computer she is using is signing it and as long as you can't trust the underlying operating system, the whole thing is moved. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think Bruce is right at some level about that, but I would be reluctant to, uh, to throw the baby out of the bathwater and, and say that digital signatures are worthless. Uh, you know, digital signatures could be made to work in other ways, maybe with smart cards, or if you have a computer that you uh, have taken care not to let hostile software penetrate the computer, then you'll probably be okay. You know, you have to look at the threat model. You know, that mafia guy, uh, Nicky Scarfo, where they broke into his house and, and, you know, put a keyboard sniffer in his computer, you know, that's a rare case. Uh, the rest of the millions of people who use PGP are not likely to have somebody break into their house and put a keyboard sniffer in. You know, the typical Alice is likely to be able to digitally sign a message and send it to the typical Bob. Uh, I wouldn't want to throw away the usefulness of having a, a, a mostly work most of the time system. I mean, look at the other parts of uh, uh, how business works. Uh, you might say, no, it has some small chance of failure because some hostile software could get in uh, to Alice's computer before she could sign something. Sure, but you know, look at the way messages are signed today. You know, somebody faxes a, a business letter with on company letterhead with a handwritten signature on it. Well, that's not very secure, and yet people accept it. You know, there's a lot of legal contracts that are signed that way. 
So if that's good enough, then why can't we have digital signatures do it? I think though we have to make sure that the legal system recognizes that digital signatures might be fallible, just like they would recognize a faxed uh, signed letterhead, you know, could be fallible. Yeah. I find it surprising that you would trust a machine on which you're allowed to run Java Atlas within a web browser to be able to do TTP or to do some kind of encrypted email. Um, the other yeah. the other thing I wanted to comment um, or get get some idea from you is um, how do you feel about GPG's unwillingness to try and interoperate with PGP 2.6.3i, which many of us feel is still a better product than the more recent PGP um, alternatives. Okay. Um, you know, I have kind of mixed feelings about that. I, I, at one level, I feel this kind of, I'm secretly pleased that people still like 2.6.2 or 2.6.3. Because that's actually my code, you know. <laughs> There's nothing left of my code of my code in, in PGP today. Actually, that's not quite true because uh, recently, I mean, about a year ago or whatever it was, uh, they came out with a command line version. Well, uh, it's awesome. and, and that just took 262 code and ripped out the crypto and replaced it with our SDK. So it still actually has my code in it. So there is still some of me in there. So it's, I'm glad to see that you like that. It's the last one that many of us trust. Yeah, well, but you know, but there's 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 other problems with it. Uh, you know, uh, it uses MD5 for the hash, which not only has MD5 been very nearly broken, but it's too small. It's 128 bits, which means it has a 64-bit work factor for for finding birthday collisions. Well, 64-bit work factor is equivalent to what a 700-bit key, something like that, 700-bit RSA key. You know, I mean, that means that anything more than 700 bits, or roughly, or let's say 1024, if you made it 1024 bit RSA key, you've already exceeded the work factor for breaking the underlying hash. And people used to complain because I had limited the RSA key sizes to 2048 bits. You know, that was vastly overkill for the size of the hash that was underneath it. Uh, you're never going to be able to use SHA 1 if you use 262. Uh, SHA-1 is a really good, not hash, it's, it hasn't been broken, but not only that, it's bigger. Aside, I mean, those two are separate. You know, its architecture is better, but it's also bigger. So, it hasn't been broken structurally, like MD5 has been broken, almost broken. And it's also a bigger hash, so it has an 80-bit work factor for finding birthday collisions, which is about the same work factor as breaking a 1024-bit modulus. It's also the origins which some of us suspect. Oh, it's so, it's peer-reviewed out the wazoo. Everybody in the world has looked at, at SHA-1. It's been around for many years. What, almost 10 years now, right? Not as long as that. Well, yeah, but I mean, but, you know, but the design elements of SHA-1 are, you know, they published a lot of stuff. I mean, there's no mysterious constants in SHA-1. You don't have S-boxes that you don't know what the design criteria were. I mean, the only constants in there are things like, you know, the cube roots of prime numbers or something like that, right? Or what is it? I don't know, some kind of mathematical constants that anybody can compute. Um, so, um, you know, and it's everybody who works in hashes today has looked at SHA-1 for many years now. There's nothing wrong with SHA-1. Uh, sorry, uh, but uh, the, uh, the design of You mean SHA-0? Yeah. yeah, they sure. fixed it. They fixed it a few weeks later with SHA-1, yeah. Later, but they didn't publish uh, the, uh, the reasons for it, and it, it took some years. To, now, since two years, we have a bit of uh, knowledge of what the security problem has been. I, I agree with you that uh, SHA is stronger, uh, power is stronger than MP5, but on, on the other hand, uh, we don't, uh, we, we have no reason to be you have no reason, but what about all these years of review that have failed to turn up anything? There's, there's, I mean, that's like how much, how many years has it gone into, uh, you know, the block ciphers that we use, idea or cast or 
you know, but Dennis has had, what, 25 years of analysis, and there's still people suspecting that there's stuff behind it. Oh, anybody who suspects that there's something behind Dez today is uh, hopelessly out of date. <laughs> you know, Dez is, is thoroughly understood now as, you know, as hydrogen, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, we know how Dez works. The world has moved far beyond that. The AES, you know, the work that went into the AES, all those AES candidates, has pushed the state of the art far beyond it. We use the knowledge that we gained from Dennis to design a lot of block ciphers since then and to develop cryptanalytic techniques like differential and linear cryptanalysis. Uh, in the early days, there was a lot of suspicion about Dez because uh, IBM didn't publish the details of what went into the S-Box design. The reason why they didn't was not because there was some back doors in it, but because they had developed the technique of differential cryptanalysis. And the NSA saw that and uh, didn't want them to reveal the technique of differential cryptanalysis because the NSA used differential cryptanalysis. They didn't want anybody else to use it, only the NSA. They wanted to keep it for themselves. So that's why the design criteria, which was to create the S-boxes and devs to be resistant to differential cryptanalysis, uh, that's, you know, that's why they didn't reveal the design criteria. And actually, DES is fairly resistant to differential cryptanalysis. They figured out when I mean, the word factor for breaking DES with differential cryptanalysis is, is less than the key size, but it's still less work than, than in practical terms than trying to exhaust the key space because you can exhaust the key space offline. You don't need two to the 47 you know, plain text, ciphertext pairs to compare it because you're never going to get that in the real world. I'm aware of all this. I'm sorry. <laughs> SHA-1 is very well reviewed, and yeah, there was a lapse in the beginning when they had to fix the problem, and they didn't tell us why, but we figured it out later on our own. The fact that we figured it out later on our own is an example of how well we understand SHA-1. <laughs> There's two institutions at NSA. There's the Signals Intelligence Group, which has all most of the money and the budget and, and the political power, and there is this little group that actually builds codes, you know, to protect things. That's Brian Snow's group. And uh, uh, I actually think they should split it into two agencies so that they have more independence. I'd rather go with SHA-1 than MD-5. MD-5 has been shown to be weak by a German cryptanalyst. <laughs> Who, by the way, worked for the German equivalent of the NSA. Yeah, but he, well, he did then. Uh, Hans Dobberton. Yeah? You didn't tackle the previous question about the Java. Oh, uh, yeah, Java. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, Java has its limitations. You know, the, you know, the worst thing about Java is that uh, the big integer class is, is uh, immutable, which means that when you do calculations with it, you can't destroy key material when you're done because you can't really get to the memory locations that store the big integers. If you set them equal to zero when you're done, it doesn't really set it equal to zero. It makes another copy of it. It frees the old space, makes another copy, and sets the new copy to zero. Um, that's a really stupid design. <laughs> and, and I actually talked to the guy who, who uh, ported Colin Plum's code to Java. I mean, he didn't port it to Java. He built it into the Java runtime environment. It became part of one of the built-in classes. And he said, well, what's wrong with that? You know, <laughs> uh, I had to convince him of the importance of destroying key material. And so he said that he would put it in in the next release. Now, he said that he wasn't sure if that would make it into the Java 1.4 release because it was, you know, it was very close to being in beta, or I don't know whether it started beta or it was very close to starting beta, but he said he would try, try to get it into 1.4, but if he didn't, he might have to wait for the next release. Um, I guess more to the point, the question is where does that Java client come from? Where well, does that Java code come from when you go and sit down at a random machine in a, in a cyber cafe? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in theory, it's signed, but you know we can't really be sure of all the steps along the way of getting something signed that's delivered to you through SSL with an X509 signature on it. Um, 
you know, uh, there's a lot of convenience in being able to download a Java applet and run it. And, and you know, th those two pie charts I just showed you, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that the second pie chart is completely covered with PGP. But I'm embarrassed by the fact that the first pie chart has such a thin wedge. The reason why that wedge is so thin is because of ease of use. And, you know, if we had, if we made it easier to use, by making it in Java and making it in other things like running it on a web browser so that you know, maybe you can have all the keys centrally controlled, uh, then it's not going to be as secure as the PGP I design. But more people will use it. So, I mean, it's like seatbelts. Imagine that, if, imagine if there were two kinds of seatbelts, one that you'd have to manually buckle you know, like an astronaut set of seatbelts up here and down here and across here and all that to get in your car and drive to the store. And another seatbelt that buckles itself automatically when you close the door. Well, I suspect that in a crash, the plane designed for astronauts would be more secure. But I don't think that many people are going to buckle that seatbelt. So I think they're going to just sit there in the car and have no seatbelt on. And so I think in a world where all the cars are equipped with astronaut seatbelts, harnesses, and all that stuff, that more people will die in accidents than a world where the seatbelt automatically fastens itself when you close the door. And maybe there will be some, you know, some small percentage of those that don't work as well in a crash. But everybody's going to be wearing them. So overall, it lowers the number of traffic deaths. The same argument can be used for deaths versus three deaths. Yeah, well, so I don't want to use deaths. <laughs> I, I agree, but the base, uh, that there is a secure way, should be there. You should have an option. You should, yeah, you should use whatever you can, but, but PGP was designed for power users, and look how many people are using it today. Your mom can't use PGP, whether it has a GUI or not. She can't use it because she doesn't understand trust models. You know, something's wrong. we got to change something. We have to make something so that your mom can use PGP, or your mom can use crypto. Okay, but, but I'm, I'm against them starting at this level of what you're proposing now, and then uh, building up to the same PGP. But I think you should start with what you did. Start with the same PGPs. Yeah. Make it easier. Well, I did. Yeah, okay. Okay, <laughs> so let's keep that. <laughs> well, let's make some other crypto tools that are easier to use. By the way, we have this room until, oh my goodness, it's 5.30. All right. Yeah, jeez. Oh, wow. Okay, that's why people are leaving. I thought I was getting bored. Okay. <laughs> All right.
ze dan tot nemen. Dan moet 